Okay, um, welcome everybody. My name is um, Stacey Matrazo, Oops. and I am the Executive Director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, I Eat Flowers and Other Things, a Seasonal Guide to Florida's Wild Edible Plants. For those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. You can learn more about our work at uh, our website at www.flawildflowers.org. Our work is made possible um, primarily through the sale and renewal of the Florida State Wildflower License Plate. Um, this is our old plate here. We have a new one now, but whether you have the old plate or the new, you are supporting our work and we thank you. Um, these funds from the license plate, as well as donations and memberships, allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. We'd like to encourage those of you who um, find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildfire license plate. And if you purchase or have either of those tags, the old one or the new, you are eligible for a membership. Uh, just let us know that you have the tag and we'll get you set up in our database. Be sure to check our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers to learn where to see wildflowers in bloom um, and to learn about upcoming events and more. We are also on social media. You can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Um, we've got some great programs coming up. February is National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Well, a week is coming up in February. Um, and with that, Dia Lawrence, uh, Extension Scientist and Assessment Coordinator for the University of Florida IFAS, will pre be presenting invasive species Pathways, Process, Impacts, and Prevention on Wednesday, fe February 15th. Um, we also have some great field trips coming up. Our February field trip will be led by our own Emily Bell at Pumpkin Creek, no, excuse me, Pumpkin Hill Creek Preserve State Park in Jacksonville, where um, we will hopefully see some sky blue lupine and small butterwort in bloom. And then in March, we'll be exploring the Everglades with award-winning naturalist and author Roger Hammer. We hope to see some uh, grass pink orchids and other uh, wildflowers unique to the Florida Everglades. So all of these can be, uh, you can register for them on our website and be sure to follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to uh, stay abreast of all of these and more opportunities. I have um, just a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, all attendees are muted and cameras are off. Um, if you have questions, you can submit them through the Q&A feature at any point during the presentation. We will um, address those questions with our presenter at the end of the presentation as time permits. And if your question is not answered, you can email it to us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will be sure to um, pass that on to our presenter or get an answer for you. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available in about 24 to 48 hours on our website and our YouTube channel. And it will also be emailed uh, to you all um, for when you, to anyone who's registered for this event. Um, I do want to say that today's presentation may run a little bit longer, maybe around 15 minutes or so. So if you need to leave before that, know that we are recording it. Um, and again, that link will be emailed to you as well. Um, but if you are uh, available, I encourage you to stick around. Um, it's going to be a really um, very interesting and informative presentation. So I um, just want to let you know that in advance. Um, now I would like to introduce our speaker. Betsy Harris is a native Floridian and naturalist who grew up along the waterways and woods of Northeast Florida. Her passion lies in promoting and preserving the remaining fragmented pieces of what she refers to as her botanical heritage, specifically the native flora and natural communities that provide Northeast Florida its distinct ecological character and make it unique from the rest of the state. She can often be found roaming around Cary State Forest, 
admiring wildflowers, or exploring the intersections of the environment and humanities through papermaking, printing, weaving, and wild crafting local plants. Without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Betsy. Um, oops, got ahead of myself already. Um, <laughs> hi there. Um, thank you to Stacy and the Florida Wildflower Foundation for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, I'm Betsy Harris. I'm actually a surf instructor by trade. But I'm a passionate uh, native plant and wildflower enthusiast and a naturalist at heart. And I am a forager. And so what does that mean, forager? Well, I collect and consume wild foods, foods that I neither grew or purchase, mainly plants, but also sometimes mushrooms. And People usually laugh when I tell them that I got into foraging because I am a terrible gardener, um, but it's true. I have the very good fortune of living on Amelia Island. It is the northernmost barrier island on the east coast of Florida. And my backyard is basically an extension of the beach, a literal sand dune. And while there are many plants that are adapted to that particularly harsh environment, growing traditional produce, things like tomatoes and squash and cucumbers, uh, is next to impossible um, without tremendous efforts at soil amendments and a lot of supplementary watering. And I wasn't very comfortable with that. So after a couple of seasons of trying and failing to have a traditional vegetable garden, I started to look around my yard and there's an undeveloped lot next door and other natural areas around me and asked, well, what does like to grow here? What would have sustained people before the convenience of Publix or DoorDash? And it turns out quite a lot. The very first plant that I found was Yaokon Holly. It was growing robustly um, along the edge of my yard and my neighbors. And my partner mentioned to me that he had heard that it was called the Black Drink and had been used for tea. Um, I did a little bit of internet research, sure enough, called the black drink, used for tea. I harvested some, roasted it, we drank it. It was pleasant, I enjoyed it. And from there, I started to look at the entire world a little bit differently. I discovered elderberry and beautyberry and winged sumac and wild oyster mushrooms. And now I think I've consumed somewhere around upwards of 50 wild plants and mushrooms, foods that would have been consumed for thousands of years, but foods that are now hard pressed to find in the grocery store and food traditions that have all but disappeared. Along the way, I have learned more than I ever could have imagined about the natural communities that exist in my part of the world. I now know when to look for the first mulberry blossoms in spring, how much rain it takes on a summer afternoon to flush chanterelle mushrooms. That hopness marks the start of autumn at least for me here on Amelia Island. And that pine needle soda is a wonderful way to ring in the new year. I know that it takes a really cold night to make a lion's mane mushroom fruit that you will never beat the critters to the wild pawpaw fruits. And to check underneath the leaves and flowers of passion flower before harvesting to make sure that I don't incidentally take home some gulf fritillary eggs or caterpillars. 
this afternoon, I'm going to share with you all uh, somewhere between 16 and 20 wild plants that are abundant in my area. As you all know, Florida is a very large state. It encompasses many different climates and ecosystems. And I have tried to include a mix of plants that I believe are found around the state. But it is helpful if you remember that I do live in far northeast Florida. I'm close enough to Georgia that I could literally catch a peach tossed over the state line. So if you are much further south, than me, our seasons are possibly different. Uh, before I go into it, I also feel that it is important to tell you that I am not a botanist, I'm not a biologist, I'm not an herbalist, I'm not any sort of professional is, except a plant enthusiast who cares deeply about our local ecosystems. You should always do your own research before consuming any wild food. My goal for this presentation is not to educate you on plant identification, but to inspire you to look at our native plants a little differently and consider the potential of wild food to perhaps aid in conservation movements by elevating these foods from perceived weeds or nuisances to flavors. Flavors that are rich with history and tradition of our state. And so let's get started. I have designed this presentation to go through the seasons and I'm gonna start right here in winter. Yeah. All right, Eastern red cedar, obviously not what you would think of as a traditional wildflower, but our native red cedar, which actually is not a cedar, but a juniper, flowers prolifically in the fall, and the females produce these beautiful blue fruit. They are often referred to as juniper berries, but junipers are conifers, and so they're actually modified cones. They have a resinous, somewhat piney flavor. Um, I recently described them to a friend as, if you've ever wondered what your Christmas tree tasted like, it tastes like juniper. It's not something that you're going to go out and collect two gallons of and serve in a bowl for breakfast. This is something that you're going to use sparingly, perhaps to flavor sauerkraut or to use in a fermentation like a wild sourdough or a vinegar. But my favorite thing to do with juniper is to make a syrup with it. Um, juniper syrup is great for sweetening mugs of hot tea. It's great in cocktails or mocktails. And you can see on the screen, I've used it to poach pears in. Um, in the bottom corner, I made a juniper pear upside down cake with the syrup. And then of course, it can be used fresh in its cone form, or you can harvest it now while it's out and ripe and dry it to have um, year round in your spice cabinet. The next plant that I wanted to take a look at is pine. Um, obviously pines are evergreen and the needles are available year round but I think of the flavor of pine for some reason, in my mind, it's sort of, I always think of it in winter. And it is similar to juniper, um, but while juniper kind of has a pine flavor, I find pine to often have a citrusy flavor. And you can collect pollen from the young pine cones, but it's typically the needles that I work with 
They're often used for tea, but they can also be used for syrups and seasonings, sodas. You can make pine needle vinegar. Um, a note about pine is that it, the needles do contain some volatile oils. You don't ever want to boil them. You can steep them in hot water to extract the flavor, but don't bring them to a boil. Um, in that upper right corner, there is a wild pine soda. This is all the rage in the foraging world right now. That's um, pine needles and orange slices and cranberry and a little bit of ginger. Um, plain water and sugar, and I left it on my counter to ferment for a few days and got this wonderful pine flavored soda. Um, I have made pine needle syrup. You can see that in the bottom right corner. Those same ingredients, cranberry and pine and orange pair really well together. I used that to make a simple syrup and infused apples um, and served it with pancakes. And then next, we are eventually gonna get to actual wildflowers, but they're few and far between in winter. And so I have prickly pear. Uh, we have eight native Apuntia species in Florida. I think there's two non-native, but both the fruit and young pads are edible. The fruit are referred to often as tunas, like the fish and the pads, nopales, and both of them are very popular in Central American cuisine. If you've ever had the opportunity to be down in Mexico, um, you've probably found one or both on a menu. The fruit can be eaten fresh or it can be used in desserts. It's often juiced, um, used in syrups. You can make prickly pear wine or soda with it. Uh, the flavor is what I call kind of earthy sweet, um, much sweeter than a beet, but that same sort of, there's an earthy undertone to it. The young pads, so not like the ones on the slide, but very young and tender pads, they're really flexible. Um, they can be used just like okra. Of course, if you have ever brushed up against a prickly pear, then you know that it's not the larger spines on the cactus that are the danger. It's these teeny tiny spines that are in all of those little circles, both on the fruit and pad. They're called gocklids. They're nearly invisible. And once they get into your skin, they're also nearly impossible to remove. So I recommend, I like to use tongs when harvesting prickly pear, and then I'll also use tongs to hold the fruit and clean it. And these are a few of the things that I've done with it in the past. That upper right corner, that's fresh cleaned prickly pear cut in half. I mentioned that it can be eaten raw, but you can see that it's full of seeds. Um, and those seeds are actually also edible. They can be uh, dried, roasted, and ground into a flour. Uh, prickly pear also makes wonderful beverages. And it too um, pairs really well with citrus. So the flavor of prickly pear and orange or lemon or lime, um, like that prickly pear key lime pie is really wonderful. The last thing I want to talk about for winter uh, are wild greens. We don't think too much about um, edible greens in winter time when it's nice and chilly out, but they're here. Um, we have chickweed, purslane, meadow garlic, and soya, sorrel. And the chickweed, the purslane, and the wood sorrel are what I call volunteer plants. Um, you probably have them in your yard right now. Um, if not in your yard, you might peek into your potted plants. They're probably there. They're all very tender greens that are best eaten fresh, but can be cooked. 
chickweed is pretty easy to identify because if you take one of the stems and bend it gently, the outer layer will snap open, but it'll reveal an inner cord that is stretchy, kind of like a natural rubber band. Uh, Purslane is kind of like a succulent. It's sort of fleshy, but has a really pleasant lemony um, tart flavor to it. And wood sorrel um, is very like tender and thin, the leaves, but it also has a very lemony, um, tart, nice flavor. Meadow garlic, you'll probably find with your nose before your eyes. It smells and looks, in my opinion, exactly like a green onion or like chives, um, but it is a true garlic. It has flat leaves and not hollow stems like an onion. And I usually just clip off those upper um, stems and use them, but it does produce a little edible garlic bulb underground as well. Here's a few of the things that I do with um, wild greens. Any of them or all of them or a combination of them can be used to make pesto, um, pilafs, meadow garlic. The flavor is strong enough that um, it stands up well to cooking. And so I like to use it in flatbreads or think about garlic rolls or any type of Italian dish um, is really nice use for meadow garlic. We're gonna slowly transition into spring. And I use this picture of a small flower pawpaw, but if you caught my introduction, you might remember that I mentioned that it is nearly impossible to be raccoons and possums and squirrels to pop off fruit, but you will see the flowers in the spring. And this one, small flower pawpaw, has those beautiful maroon flowers. Most of our other pawpaws have um, much larger white or creamy off-white flowers. Something that is abundant and easy to harvest and that most people are familiar with is greenbrier. Um, maybe more commonly known as Smilax. And I'm sure at least one person in the audience is groaning or frowning and not a fan of Smilax in their yard. It can be quite aggressive in certain environments and it's often covered in thorns and prickly parts and it can be kind of vicious like a blackberry. But in spring, it puts off these tender shoots, and I like to call it Florida wild asparagus. The shoots can be eaten raw or cooked. It's easy to harvest. Start at that very tip with your fingers and work your way down the vine, bending it gently until it finds a part where it snaps easily. Uh, in that upper right hand corner, I have an image of the roots. If you've ever tried to eradicate it from your yard, you've probably found these. Um, we call it Smilax. I like to call it Greenbrier, but another common name is Sarsaparilla vine or Sarsaparilla vine. And these roots are what is used to originally make Sarsaparilla flavored sodas. Here's a couple of my favorite uses for Smilax. It is particularly nice um, pickled, just like asparagus. I love to use it in the spring in wild quiches with um, other wild greens like the meadow garlic or wood sorrel. And then I have made a Smilax soda with the roots. And what I want to, that photo is a little bit old and you can see that those are whole roots. Um, when I make that soda now, and so that's Smilax roots, um, sugar, a star anise, vanilla pod, um, and sometimes a cinnamon stick. 
But what I do now is to shred um, or chop those roots to expose some of the inner core and extract that flavor. Another prickly, oftentimes unwanted, but highly edible plant is thistle. Uh, the basil rosette of thistle can be seen year round, but they grow low and flat to the ground, so you don't really notice them unless you step on them. You don't really notice them until February or March when they shoot up this tall flower stalk. Um, the entire plant is technically edible. If you have the patience or desire, you can clip all of those spiky bits off of the leaves and cook them like any other green, like you would cook kale or spinach. But my favorite part of thistle is the stalk. Once it is skinned, it is very similar in looks and taste to celery. Um, I have a photo of it there in the upper right. That's what it looks like once you've skinned off those uh, hairy outer bits. And if you don't want to eat thistle, you might still consider leaving it in your yard. It is the host plant for the little metal mark and painted lady, painted lady butterflies. Um, a couple of the things that I've done with it, like I said, I think it tastes like celery. I've made cream of thistle soup, pickled shrimp. And um, if you're familiar with the Holy Trinity, onion, pepper, and thistle, I use that as the base for thistle corn chowder. All right, an actual real wildflower. Um, one that probably all of you know, spiderwort. The flowers can be eaten fresh. Uh, they make a really striking garnish. You can put them obviously on top of a salad but they look really beautiful in um, fresh spring rolls, those ones that have the clear wrappers. If you put a couple um, flowers underneath, that's really stunning. Or you can use them to make uh, fermented beverages. The leaves can be used like any other pot herbs, so the whole plant can be cooked just like you would cook spinach or kale. Uh, most of you have probably observed that the flowers are typically only open in the morning and they close up as the sun gets overhead. I did not have a ton of photos of recipes using spiderwort, but I know I've mentioned wild sodas a few times now, and so I thought I would share my basic recipe. Um, like Stacy said, this presentation is being recorded, so if you don't get a screen grab right now, don't worry about rushing to scribble this down. Um, you can come back to it. But an important aspect of being a good forager, I think, is to be a little bit adept at food preservation. Um, if you've spent any time and effort going out and collecting wild food, then you want to make sure that you can preserve your harvest or extend it for as long as possible. And so I make a lot of jams and jellies and syrups and pickles, and I ferment a lot of things in order to capture and save the flavors of the harvest for a longer time. And one of my favorite things to do is to make these wild sodas. Uh, they're very easy to make. You can have a lot of fun with them. You can use any edible flour, um, but you can also make any combination of flavors by using edible herbs or spices or fruits. Uh, but combinations are really endless. All right, mulberries. This is one of my very favorite um, spring 
plants, I get so excited when mulberries start to ripen. We have two different ones in Florida. We have the non-native white mulberry, Morris alba, and our native red mulberry, Morris rubra. They are kind of hard to tell apart. They both produce edible fruit that starts off green, it matures to red, and it eventually ripens to that purpley black color like the one at the forefront of the photo. Uh, mulberries are a favorite of birds. So if you want to plant one in your yard, do not plant it where you park. Um, but most trees produce thousands of ber berries and the trees get a, kind of tall, at least 15 feet tall. And so the vast majority of the berries are out of our reach. And I think there's enough for us and birds to enjoy. The texture of a mulberry falls in between a raspberry and a blackberry. It's firmer than a raspberry, but not quite as firm as blackberry. The flavor, though, is not at all tart. It's deliciously sweet. And I just think mulberries are genuinely an underappreciated fruit that I wish were more celebrated. It's not considered marketable because they're fragile and don't have a long shelf life. Otherwise, I am certain that we would find them in the grocery store. And uh, here's a few of the things that I have done with mulberry, um, mulberry pop tarts, honey fermented mulberries, which is simply fresh mulberries covered in honey and left to ferment on the counter for a few days. Um, if you make any sort of juice or syrup with them, you'll be left over with some mulberry pulp that you could use to infuse vinegar. And you have a very unique and hyper local mulberry vinegar. Um, and then they pair really well with balsamic vinegar in mulberry compotes. Moving right along into summer, elder. Uh, elder flower and elderberry, it's one of the very first plants that I started to forage and that was a very long time ago and it's so one of my very favorite plants to forage. Um, like I said, I live in far north Florida, so your elder season might be different than mine. It's probably longer than mine. Um, you might start seeing flowers in late February or March. Um, I don't get them until April or May, but I do know that it's abundant around the state. And I have seen it form very dense stands. So like near thickets of elderberry, um, the creamy, white flower clusters and dark berries can be used in a multitude of ways. When you're collecting elder flower, you want to select the most fragrant bunches. So this is a time when you're going to get really up close and personal with the plant. You want to stick your face uh, right into that flower cluster and make sure that you're selecting for the sweetest smelling flowers. That's going to give you the best flavor. And then you also want to make sure that, of course, we leave plenty of flowers to be pollinated and then turn into fruit. Uh, fruit for me is typically ripe in July through September. And you want to make sure when you harvest it that it is very dark purpley black. You do not want underripe elderberry. Um, there is a lot of information about eating elderberry online and a lot of that information is contradictory to itself. Um, but it is typically recommended that you cook the berries before they're consumed. 
they are full, the berries are full of tiny seeds. It's not the best sensory experience. And so personally, I think the best way to use elderberry is to juice the berries. And then I could have made like eight slides just about elderberry and elderflower and all the things I like to do with it. But here's a couple of my favorites. Um, the flowers are very traditionally used in Europe to make elderflower cordial. And it's a lot like making a wild soda. It's clusters of the flower heads and sliced lemon and sugar infused into water and fermented for a couple of days. Um, and so those elderflower popsicles were made with elder cordial and fresh peaches um, blended together and frozen. Uh, elderberry jelly is just kind of a hallmark of um, elderberry to me. It's my favorite thing to have on New Year's Day. It's a little bit of a good luck omen that I'm gonna have a good foraging year. And then elderberry pairs uh, really well with coconut and so that Lower left hand corner that should say elderberry coconut cream bars. Um, if you have not had elderberry, it's a little bit tart. Uh, it's wonderful and delicious, but a little tart. And so it pairs really well with coconut. And then if you do juice your elderberry, like I like to do, um, if you juice it, you're gonna have a nice container of dark purple juice, but then you're also gonna have all of the skin and the seeds and a little bit of residual pulp. And I like to take that and put it in a glass jar and cover it with white sugar and allow it to infuse for a couple of weeks. And then you're left with that beautiful purple elderberry sugar. All right. Cat tails, I had to include them in this presentation. I love cat tails. Um, most oftentimes when people think of them, you probably think of those dark brown uh, flower heads. That's actually when it's gone to seed. Um, you wanna harvest cat tails well before then. But the whole plant is edible. So the flower head before it's gone to seed, when it's in bud or when it has bloomed. Um, and then the roots and the shoots are also edible. The flowers taste and sometimes are eaten quite a bit like corn. Um, cattail pollen is collected oftentimes and added to baked goods like biscuits or crackers. I have that photo in the upper left hand corner. So the green ones at the bottom, that is the flower head when it is in bud. Um, and people genuinely eat that just like corn on the cob. Um, you can boil it, you can roast it, you can steam it, you can wrap it in foil. But what I like to do is actually remove the flowers from the stalk and um, use it to make like cattail fritters or add it into casseroles, um, any way that you would use corn. And then if you squint in that upper right hand corner, those tiny white circles on the salad, those are fresh cattail shoots. Um, it's very reminiscent of heart of palm. Probably one of the more difficult plants to harvest. You want to be sure that the water quality, that if you're going to harvest roots and shoots from, that the water quality is good. You're most likely going to get your feet wet. And to get to the root, you're going to have to plunge your hand down into the water and kind of in the mud and the muck and feel around for them. But it is a really nice flavor and pretty abundant. And sometimes people consider it weedy. They, they are an aggressive plant that will kind of take over a pond or a ditch. Uh, next summertime, 
another wildflower, passion flower. Everyone loves it. Everyone, I'm sure, thinks it's just one of the most stunning wildflowers that we have. And if you have ever purchased passion flower tea from the store, if you turn the box over, it most likely is Passiflora incarnata, our uh, native purple passion flower. The entire plant is edible. Um, most of it is most often used for tea, but the Cherokee did take the leaves and they would boil them and fry them in hot oil. And then of course, um, if you don't harvest the flower and it's been pollinated, it will turn into passion fruit. It's not exactly like the tropical passion fruit that you might find in Hawaii or places like that, um, but it is edible and it can be juiced. You know that passion fruit is ripe when it has started to turn a little bit yellow and get a little bit wrinkly, when you find those bright green fruit, um, they're not ripe yet, they don't have any juice, the seeds haven't developed. So let it get yellow, let it get a little wrinkly. Um, the photo in the right hand corner is fresh uh, ripe fruit. That's what it looks like inside. You can pop those little um, seed packets into your mouth and they're full of a beautiful, wonderful, tart little juice. Um, you can juice our passion fruit. I did um, last year and used it to make popsicles with. And then uh, you can make your own passion flower, passion fruit tea blend. Um, you can take the leaves, you can take the flowers, you can take the roots or any combination and dry them either in a dehydrator or I don't have one. You can put them in your oven on the lowest heat and make your own tea blends with them. Um, that particular one, that's passion flower and yalpon and goldenrod um, and a little bit of dried orange peel. All right. Cabbage palms. Um, a lot of people know that cabbage palms is our state tree and that it used to be commonly uh, perhaps eaten and referred to as swamp cabbage. Um, if you have the pleasure of living in Hendry County, you might have gone to the annual swamp cabbage festival. Um, but I don't think that people often think of using the flower. Um, in the summertime, the cabbage palms put off this giant stalk of palm blossoms. And if you have ever walked past one, then you know it's very fragrant. Um, it's probably covered in bees. And the flowers can be eaten fresh, but they're really nice when you make a um, palm blossom syrup or a palm blossom vinegar. I tried to get a little creative with it last summer. I made a, a simple palm blossom syrup by taking some of the flowers and infusing it in simple syrup. Um, and then I used that to glaze that palm blossom delight. I infused the palm blossom syrup into butter and then had palm blossom butter. Uh, and then I used the syrup and the butter uh, and mixed it with hot sauce and made a spicy palm blossom chicken sandwich. Um, you can harvest fresh palm hearts. That's the upper left photo. It's incredibly labor intensive. Um, you probably need at least an ax and a saw, if not a chainsaw. And it does kill the tree. Um, so you probably only want to harvest a fresh palm heart uh, if you're trying to get rid of your cabbage palm. All right. And then finally, for summertime yucca, um, 
all of our yucca flowers are edible. I think it's an excellent eating flower. Um, they can be eaten fresh, deep fried, steamed, or candied. They make a wonderful edible little uh, cup or bowl. Um, there on the left hand side are yucca blossoms and they're just stuffed with like an herby uh, wild mushroom cream cheese or um, I think that's like a mango salsa or something, but they make a fantastic little edible bowl. Uh, and then sometimes they're also deep fried. So I took the flour, um, dipped it into some pancake syrup and threw it in the deep fryer. And I basically had a yucca blossom funnel cake um, and that's some elderberry syrup there to dip into it. All right, transitioning to our last season, fall. Um, I promise you that this is the last time I'm going to bait you with a pawpaw photo uh, because you are never going to beat the wild animals to it. Um, but that tiny photo, those are three ripe pawpaw fruit, you'll notice that they're yellow and not green. And um, if you want to know how hard it is to gather them, it took me seven years of watching pawpaws fruit, uh, flower and fruit, and following them, dropping pens on them, checking them weekly. Um, seven years before I was able to taste my first uh, wild pawpaw. An edible plant found in fall that you might not be familiar with, but it is pretty common. Um, it's often called ground nut, but there's a lot of plants called ground nuts. So I like to call it hopness. And it has those beautiful mauve, rosy colored blooms. Um, botanically, it's Apios Americana. And on the East Coast, it goes all the way from Miami-Dade County all the way up to Canada. Uh, it was a very important food source for Indigenous Americans and then for colonists. Um, and they were not necessarily eating the flowers, although the flowers have a really nice flavor. Um, they were eating the tubers. There's an underground tuber that can um, be boiled or fried or roasted like potatoes. Um, I just like to use those flowers fresh, but those are the tubers in my hand there. They range wildly in size. You can find some that are six inches and then you could find some that are less than an inch. Um, very much like a potato, except you need to peel off that tough outer skin. Um, I just peel them, drop them into boiling water for not even a minute, and then you can fry them, bake them, anything that you could think of to do with potato. And then winged sumac. Um, the first thing that everyone says about sumac is, isn't it poisonous? And the answer is no. Uh, winged sumac, Rus popolinum, is not poisonous. Uh, the plant that we call poison sumac is actually in the genus Toxicodendron, so the same genus as poison ivy. How can you tell the difference? Well, our edible winged sumac produces dark red fruit, like you see in the photo, and poison sumac produces white fruit. Uh, our edible winged sumac also likes to grow where it is high and dry in a sandy soil. And poison sumac is nearly always found in standing water. Sumac 
fruits, they're not actually berries, they're droops. And that means that they have very little um, pulp or flesh. It's mainly the outer skin and a very large seed. But the outside of the skin is covered in a substance called malic acid and also gives sumac a very tart, lemony flavor. Um, traditionally, I think it's best known for sumac aid or sumac lemonade. Um, you take that big cluster of fruit and just plunge it into a pitcher of water and allow it to infuse. But my favorite thing to do with sumac is to dry it and grind it um, as a spice. You can then use that spice any way that you would use a dried lemon rind. Um, you could use sumac. You can also use the droops and infuse sugar with it, just like we did with elderberry, and you'll have that one will be really tart and sweet at the same time. Uh, I've taken the droops and infused it with butter and garlic for like a sumac butter. Um, I did want to mention about that photo on the lower left, the green leaves in the pan, those are not sumac leaves. Um, sumac leaves are full of tannins, which would be very bitter. Um, that's actually um, bayberry or uh, wax myrtle uh, leaves in the pan with the sumac. And then wild grapes. Um, I couldn't decide whether to put grapes in spring or fall. Um, obviously, you're going to find grapes, the actual fruit in the fall, but in spring is the time to harvest grape leaves. And one of my very favorite spring treats is stuffed grape leaves. You wanna find one of the grape species that has larger leaves. Um, the, the actual muscadines tend to have pretty small leaves, but we have several species that produce larger ones. And grapes also have quite a bit of tannins in them. So as the season progresses, they get quite bitter. But if you can catch them in the spring when they've just sort of unfurled and they're nice and tender and fresh, um, grape leaves are a real treat and there's a lot of things that you can do with them. And then of course, grapes themselves, muscadine grapes, ours have, pretty big seeds and then the skin is really tough and most of the time you don't eat them, eat the skin, but they're wonderful in jams and jellies. Um, a few of the things that I've done with them, stuffed grape leaves and then grape leaf chips, just like kale chips. Um, and then the uses for the fruit are endless, obviously jam, jelly, but also um, you can infuse gin or vodka or any other clear spirit with grapes. Uh, you can make grape syrup and grape vinegar. Uh, lots of different uses for our native grapes. And then the last plant that I wanted to highlight today are wild native persimmons. Uh, Yes, they're much smaller than their uh, Asian counterparts that you find at the store, uh, but they're just as tasty. Um, they get very, very sweet. Um, you do want to harvest persimmon when the fruit is very, very soft and has some black spots on it. Our native persimmons are every bit as astringent as the ones you can find at the store. So you want to make sure that they are ripe. And I would say that the ones in my hand actually aren't ripe. I gathered those off the ground and I think they probably came down in a hard wind. You would actually want the skin um, to be a little bit wrinkled and the black spots to be larger. They're best eaten fresh, but 
they can be used to make persimmon butter, which is just like apple butter. Um, I've made persimmon glazed donuts. I use the persimmon butter to make uh, persimmon pecan rolls. And then the flavor of persimmon lends itself really well to uh, barbecue sauce. All right, uh, those are all the plants that I have. Everybody's ready to go out and start harvesting some wild food, right? Um, well, good foragers are bound by ethics. Um, one of my favorite authors is Robin Wellkimmer. She wrote a fantastic book called Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, highly recommend it. But she also drafted this one time. It's called The Honorable Harvest. And these are kind of the rules that I live by and use in foraging. And so she says to ask permission, and she means of the plants themselves, uh, never take the first and please never take the last. Um, harvest in a way that minimizes harm, both to the plants that you're harvesting, but also to other plants and any small creatures that might be nearby. Uh, take only what you need, use everything that you take, take only that which is given, share, be grateful, reciprocate. And she says, Sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. So now we know plants and we know the ethics. Where do we begin? In our own yard. Um, I know that seems kind of obvious and I hope it doesn't sound condescending, but your yard is the place that you know the best. Um, and you might initially think that there's not anything there, but before you go out into some pristine wild area, if those places exist, uh, make sure that you can identify everything in your yard throughout the entire year, because if your yard's like mine, it often changes. Um, and then once you have identified everything in your yard, move over to your neighbor's yard because they probably don't want their edible plants. Um, resources, if you're inspired and you want to know more about our edible wild plants than I was able to cover, I recommend um, Florida's Edible Wild Plants is a wonderfully small, easy to read book um, specifically for Florida. And um, there's a book called Forage Harvest Feet by Marie Viljoen. She is a forager up in New York, but many of the plants that she features are also found here in Florida. Uh, Florida Ethnobotany is a bit of a textbook, more like an encyclopedia, but it is simply a long running list of every ethnobotanical use known about our plants. Uh, the website eattheweeds.com is user friendly and the uh, administrator lives in central Florida. So all of those plants are commonly found in the state. And then if you are on social media, uh, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, obviously, I didn't share very many recipes. Um, if you are interested in something that you saw today, almost all of my presentation was taken from my Instagram. If you are to go there, you'll find the recipes there. And then this is my last slide, and it's just a thought to leave you with um, Janice Reyes a Southern author who writes beautifully about um, wild places in the South. And she had this quote about wild food. And so then I'll turn it back over to Stacy uh, and ask if there were any questions. Oh yes, lots of questions. <laughs> 
Um, thank you so much. That was incredible. And um, I will just echo what a lot of the uh, people were commenting in the chat that your photography is just amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I know I talked about this with you before we got started, but um, people are asking, when is your cookbook coming out? <laughs> I hope sooner than later, but if anybody uh, watching has um, any information that could help me get started on that, if anybody knows any publishers or anyone at um, the University of Florida Press, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you. I think you've got um, a lot of takers here in this presentation. So, um, okay, so we've had uh, several questions about prickly pear cactus that I'll try to roll into one. Um, um, how do you know when to pick the fruit? And can you talk about cleaning and preparing it to remove those spines? You know, you mentioned handling with tongs, but are there other ways? Someone's asking about using a... a fire or boiling water to get rid of those spines and hairs? I don't know about boiling water. Um, I have not done it, but yes, fire. Um, so, and maybe one of those like long, like fire starters. Um, yes, people burn off the thorns or the gosslets. Um some people also use a broom, like a little tiny hand broom. Um, but like I said, I have personally found just a small pair of kitchen tongs and a vegetable brush um, is what I personally do to get them off. Um, and then the fruit, when is it ripe? A prickly pear is really cool. Um, it's ripe whenever it's dark burgundy, that beautiful deep like magenta color. Um, that but that skin on the outside, I don't know if it's it's particularly tough, but it will stay ripe on the cactus for quite a while, like months. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> So whenever you come across it, when it is that deep burgundy flavor uh, color, sorry, um, that's when it's right. Okay. Um, Jessica is asking how long you've been cooking with your found treasures. Um, oh my gosh, maybe seven or eight years since I first found Yalpon. Cool. Can you talk about sustainable harvesting, how much people should take um, so not to disturb populations? And, and also to that, we have another couple of questions about harvesting in public areas. Do you have anything um, to say about that? Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> as far as sustainability, yes, it's a pretty well-known kind of a general rule of thumb that foragers use is to never take one third of what is available to you. So whatever you find, never take more than a third. But I would also add um, harvest with intention. So, and I've been there, we can all get really excited when we find a plant or we come across a plant and you're like, hey, I recognize that from the presentation. This thing's edible. Um, don't just snatch it out of the ground right there and run home with it. Um, you know, be a little intentional with your foraging. Um, know how you plan to use it before you harvest. And that also will help you probably not take too much because if you know what you're doing, then you know how much you need. Um, of course, um, state parks have very stringent rules. You're not allowed to take any anything um, from a state park. Um, sometimes city and county parks are more lenient. Uh, your neighbor is probably a lot more lenient. Um, I live on a, on a small island, but it's pretty urban, pretty residential. And I do the vast majority of my foraging in a 10 mile radius of my house. Um, 
So I look at empty lots, certainly empty lots, um, especially ones I know that are going to be developed. I don't blink about foraging from. Um, but you do have to, you need to be careful um, if you're on public land, um, especially state property. Okay, there's a lot of questions. I'm trying to <laughs> aggregate them when they're uh, the same questions. Um, Cher says she's been tainted by food science in college. Can you talk about the fine line or difference between rotting food and fermentation? Oh, that's interesting. So I do a lot of fermenting. And actually, when you are going to ferment something, whether you're going to make pickles, uh, whether you're going to make kombucha, whether anything, you actually want um, perfectly ripe fruit, um, not fruit that is past its expiration date or its you know, kind of more enjoyable date. Um, if you come across fruit that you think you might still want to harvest, but it maybe it's past this date, um, then you want to be looking at maybe like jams or jellies or that type of preservation. But fermentation typically relies on um, yeast and bacteria on the outside skin of the fruit or the plant and you want it in pretty good condition. A couple of questions about um, cattails. I know you mentioned um, the difficulty in harvesting them, um, but as wetland plants, since wetlands are nature's, do you have any um, a guide on, on where you should harvest cattails or where you should avoid harvesting them um, and what the risks are in harvesting where they may have been treated? Um, so um, cities and municipalities and land managers often um, think of cattails as nuisances. So I, there might be a potential of them being treated but really you just want to make sure that there's not a lot of um, runoff either from industry. So you don't want to harvest um, from a retention pond next to some sort of factory or something. Um, and then you don't want to harvest from like I-10 where there's like a bunch of oil and whatever other things that road and then it drains down into them. Um, but I do think that there's plenty of ponds and ditches and lakes. Um, I do live in a little, my island is urban, but Nassau County is somewhat rural. Um, and so there's some rural areas by me with dirt roads and they grow in the ditches there. And I don't hesitate to harvest them from that area. Um, okay, there are, let's see, um, other, we have other native passiflora species uh, here in Florida. Are, are all of them edible or is it specifically the incarnata? Um, no, all of the passiflora species are edible. And any of them could be used for tea. Um, a lot of people will know that Incarnata is the only one that cooks on a sizable fruit. Mm -hmm. um, all the other species put on these little tiny sort of dime and quarter size fruit. They're edible as well, um, but I'm not sure it would be worth eating. <laughs> but you can use the leaves of uh, porky stem or any other of the Passifloras in tea. What do the yucca flowers taste like? Do they have much of a flavor to them? I, you know, they kind of taste like heart of palm. So not like some big, bold flavor, but a, a distinct flavor. So a lot of flowers like cider or, or passion flower, um, if you've ever nibbled on the actual flower, they just kind of taste earthy and herbaceous and not green, sort of, 
Um, the yucca flower tastes pleasant. Um, it's not sweet at all, but I, I kind of think of it as like a really thin part of palm flavor. Cool. We have a couple of questions around some um, native greens. Um, Florida watercress is mentioned, stinging nettle, and someone wants to know about maybe spinach alternatives. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe uh, some of the leafy greens or? I know, actually, you have any? no, um, edible greens, that's my New Year's resolution is to include more of them in my own diet um, and to become more familiar with them. And one of the ones that I just learned and we haven't got into that season yet, so is uh, Rudbeckia. Uh, coneflower greens. Um, the Native Americans were, called them sochon, um, but that was a popular green, and I have now found out that it can be used like spinach. Uh, I haven't tried it yet, so I don't know what the flavor is like, but I'll be happy to report back to you. Um, and so, Ray, I'm always looking for wild greens, too, of like substance. So the ones that I talked about today, so like chickweed and purslane and uh, wood sorrel, it, I typically only find little tiny patches of them at a time or the leaves are like kind of small. And so that's not something that you could like harvest a great quantity of and make a big pot of greens with like you would keep greens or something. Um, but I am gonna look into the rudbeckia um, fireweed, or sometimes people call it burnweed. Um, it's one of it's coming up right now. Um, comes up in winter time, typically in disturbed areas, but it has a very, very pungent flavor. Um, so I do like to eat it, but that's not one that I would personally eat a lot of either. Um. So yeah, I'm actually still working on uh, including more wild greens in my own diet. Um, but grape leaves in the spring, they really um, have a very mellow flavor um, and they're tender um, if you catch them really early. So you can use those just like you would use like spinach or something. Great. Have you tried um, uh, Spanish needles too? <laughs> Come up pretty I've, prolifically. I have tried Spanish needle and maybe I need to give it another chance, but both times that I've tried it, I personally found it to not be pleasant. Um, I thought it was pretty bitter. Um, mm. This I made a pesto with it one time and then I also cooked it like spinach. Um, I didn't enjoy it either time. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me or if it's the plants in my area, but it wasn't a favorite for me. Well, I could sit here and talk to you all day because this is incredible and um, fascinating, but um, it is 3.15. So um, I am going to um, wrap this up. Thank you so much. Um, please keep us posted on <laughs> if you have a if you if you get to the point where you're going to do a cookbook. Um, I know we would love to be able to share that with with everyone. Um, and um, I'm again follow Betsy on Instagram at Bets Harris B E T Z Harris. Um, she's got as you can tell amazing photography and incredible recipes, um, and so much more than we could fit into an hour today. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone attending. Again, if you like what we do, um, please consider becoming a member, um, making a donation, or getting that lovely state wildflower license plate uh, that helps us do this and so much more. And thank you again, Betsy. This has been just really absolutely wonderful. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.